Ok, muy bien. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Este, buenas casi noches en Europa para alguien que nos esté viendo por allá. Nos da muchísimo gusto darles la bienvenida al segundo de tres webinars que hemos estado teniendo eh, a nombre de GRESP y de PIMA para explicarles todos los componentes del assessment de GRESP. Eh, en esta ocasión, este, el componente es de los más importantes, ya que se trata del componente de desempeño, performance. Y el nombre del webinar es cómo medir lo que importa y el componente de desempeño de GRESP. Eh, usamos este título porque creemos que es vital eh, el poder saber qué es lo que tenemos que medir para poder guiarnos hacia las metas que tenemos que alcanzar en la Agenda 2030 y 2050. Y bueno, para comenzar me presento, mi nombre es Jessica Díaz Avelar, soy directora de Riesgo Ambiental y Sostenibilidad de PIMA y somos consultores en, en bienes raíces. Entonces, I'm, I'm going to say briefly thanks to our speakers in here, Dan Winters and Ethan from Prologis. We are very happy to have you here and we are about to start. I'm going to change to Spanish and thanks. Thanks all to being here. Muy bien. Eh, bueno, les vamos a comentar brevemente la agenda. Primero les vamos a dar una introducción que la va a dar Dan Winters, que es Head of America de GRESP. Después vamos a hablar un poco de los antecedentes de desempeño en el sector inmobiliario para poder ver de dónde están saliendo las últimas tendencias en la cuestión de desempeño a nivel mundial y sobre todo en real estate. Posteriormente vamos a ver el componente de desempeño. Víctor Fonseca nos los va a dar eh, de, de GRESP como analista. Y finalmente este, estamos súper contentos de tener a Ethan Gilbert, que es gerente eh, de programas ASG en Prology. Y eh, pues él es quien lleva toda la recolección de datos, todo el establecimiento de objetivos, el establecimiento de estrategias. Entonces estamos súper emocionados de que nos acompañe hoy. Finalmente vamos a repasar las conclusiones y recomendaciones y vamos a dar tiempo a preguntas y respuestas al final. Si ustedes quieren dar, hacer alguna pregunta, por favor, por medio del chat, lo pueden ir haciendo durante la presentación. Si la podemos contestar vía texto, lo haremos. Si no, nos esperaremos al final para hacérselas a alguno de nuestros ponentes. Uh -huh. Bueno, entonces eh, voy a presentarles a Dan Winters. Dan Winters es Head of Americas de GRESP. Él lleva, tiene muchísimos años de experiencia en el sector inmobiliario. Él trabajó en USGBC este, como director de estrategias y de finanzas. Tiene una maestría en desarrollo y finanzas en Harvard. Es profesor de varias universidades y pues él es el que se encarga de las estrategias eh, en Gres para todo América. Entonces, welcome Dan. Thank you for being here and please you can start. Jessica, thank you so much for having us and bringing together all of the great folks from Latin America to, to talk about uh, all of the progress that's happening now in, in ESG. So my job is really to set the stage and I've got a few slides that we can, we can show here uh, to just talk about a little bit where GRESB came from and, and what we're all trying to do together. So yeah, there you go. Okay, so what is our objective? Our objective, what do we do? We assess and we benchmark the ESG practices around the globe, right? And we do this by acquiring standardized and validated data And we provide that upwards to the capital markets, people that are, are you know, in charge of large sums of money that are flowing it out to invest in the real estate projects that we're all trying to, to, to make better um, and, and, and move the industry forward. So on the next slide, so you'll sort of see, so there's three phases in my mind of GRES. The first phase was the first few years of market development, what is ESG trying and putting together a framework and defining and, and bringing together leaders uh, to define what those best practices are. The second phase of GRES were sort of the last five years. And we worked really hard to elevate metrics and bring a broader uh, cohort together. And so you're gonna see how our global coverage has expanded to get us to the phase that we're in right now, which is you know, metrics, 
people are, are looking for elevated metrics on energy, water, waste, greenhouse gas emission data, because we're really moving in this direction of carbon and, and measuring carbon, reducing carbon and understanding what that means for our, for our fully. Let's go to the next slide. Let's see what happens. Here. So the the trajectory of Gres, we were started in 2009 by several major pension plans. And who's okay? Well, I'll just keep going. So so and then in, so we have two assessments. There's the real estate assessment, which was started in 2009, and then in 2016 we launched the infrastructure assessment to really focus and hone in on real assets. So. In, here we are in 2020. Let's go to the next slide. You know, the point is we've got these two different assessments. Today we're going to talk about the real estate assessment and those components. Um, and we're supported by these, these, these different stakeholder groups. I like this uh, diagram because it really breaks up into four quadrants who the folks are that are involved in GRESB. So on the upper left, we have the institutional investors, and they're the ones that have the capital that are deploying it out into the marketplace that is then you know, managed by organizations to invest in buildings. And with those buildings, there's, there's uh, you know, a, a series of practices that happen. So what we're trying to do is promote those best practices and really move the industry forward, create a, a, uh, an elevated race to the top. So below we have the fund managers and the companies that are putting that uh, capital to work. On the upper right, we have the uh, industry associations that support our efforts. And in the lower right, we've got the folks like Pima and the data companies that are knitting together this data ecosystem globally that's looking to advance and elevate these metrics to the capital markets. So let's go to the next slide. And here's here, this is how the GRES uh, assessment is broken up. So we had the webinar previously where we focused on the things in the upper right, leadership and risk management and policies. That's what makes up the management component all organizations that do GRES have to do the management component. And then if you have a standing portfolio of investments, there's the performance component. That's what we're going to talk about today. And so the elements that make up the performance component are shown here in green on the lower left. And these, you know, do you have targets for your GHG emissions and your energy water waste consumption? Hopefully that target is, exists and is on the way down. Um, do you do risk assessments, data monitoring and review? And a lot of this is really about, can you capture the data in your portfolio on these issues? Because what you measure, you manage, and actually it's moved forward to what you measure, you improve. So being able to acquire that data, it has been a challenge for the industry for a long time. And we've spent a decade knitting this, this ecosystem together and we're, we're poised to really advance. So let's go to the next slide and there we are. So this is what we've done over the past decade. We started in 2010, we had 200 participants in the assessment and you'll see steady, steady growth over the decade and a big advance last year, which was great because it was in the middle of what we're all experiencing globally with this pandemic. But this just goes to show that ESG has tremendous momentum. On the right-hand side, you'll see the participants in the assessment. There's typically a one to many. And so that's okay. So uh, there you go. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here right in the middle is, is our colleagues at Prologis. They submit 10 assessments. You know, they've got EU funds, they've got funds in America, they've got one of the leading funds in Latin America. And so they've really found value in the whole framework of the wash, rinse, repeat, doing the GRESB assessment on an annual basis, understanding where, the, where they are, looking for ways to improve year on year on year. All right, perfect. Let's go to the next slide. Every, per, every entity that, that uh, participates in the assessment receives the benchmark report. And there's facts and figures and graphics and charts. And so that, that's a little bit what the left-hand side looks like. The right-hand side is, uh, you know, it's one of the questions. And this is question RO 3.1. Do you do risk assessments in new acquisition? It's rare that a company does all these things. This is from one of our, this is from the sector leader in, in North America, Kilroy. And you'll see that they have uh, taken on uh, these, these, these issues and have really worked to incorporate them into their underwriting due diligence and investment committee process. Right? And then on the right-hand side, you'll see that, uh, you know, what the distribution of behavior is amongst the peers. Our goal is to get everybody to do all of these things, 100% down the line. So there you are. Let's go to the next slide. 
Gres was set up in an ISO 14001 approach, plan, do, check, act. And it, it's a tailor-made approach for institutional real estate. I talked about some of the great graphics. So you'll see how Gresb is set up with policies and, and how those uh, points are accounted for. And then on the lower right, we elevate uh, the EUIs and, and uh, the various asset level metrics that are available once somebody steps forward and does the Gresb assessment. A lot of good information that comes out of this. Go ahead. All right, so this is the last slide and, and it really uh, reinforces, you know, it's a building level up to the fund level or the firm level, which is where Gresb is, moving data on the way to the capital markets. There's a lot of interest now. Uh, there's EU regulations that are coming into play on, um, again, these energy, water, waste, and greenhouse gas emission data and, and metrics. So doing things like, like the, the building ratings, Energy Star, LEED, other things at the, at the building level, awesome, right? Report those up into the GRESB assessment uh, to understand what's happening for the entire portfolio and move that along to the ultimate investors in your firm at the capital markets. That's, that's the, the, the flow of the data and that's what we do. So with that, I believe that I now have the privilege to turn back over to our colleagues at Pima. Vanessa, would you like to uh, take the reins. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan. I, I'm just going to briefly introduce oh. Vanessa. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to to tell who Vanessa is. We are very happy to have, uh, first of all, thank you, Dan, for all the, the information. Y bueno, ahora voy a pasar a español. Entonces, eh, estamos muy contentos de que Vanessa Silva esté con nosotros. Vanessa Silva es gerente de sostenibilidad y gerente de gestión de riesgos en PIMA. Ella es ingeniera química, tiene una maestría en ingeniería ambiental y tiene una, un doctorado en ingeniería química del Politécnico y de la UNAM. Este, tiene más de 15 años de experiencia Asimismo, ella tiene un diplomado en la Universidad de Inglaterra de Sussex en temas ambientales. Y bueno, ella tiene ya cuatro años trabajando en PIMA, eh, realizando todas las estrategias para la colección de datos, el análisis de los datos y la revisión eh, con nuestros diferentes clientes. Y ha diseñado muy buenos sistemas que han permitido colectar cada vez más datos y de una forma más sólida. Entonces, nos da muchísimo gusto que nos venga a platicar un poco de la experiencia. Y Vanessa, adelante. Muchas gracias, Jess. Bueno, es importante comenzar diciendo eh, que, bueno, en medio de toda la disrupción e incertidumbre de, de este año que hemos tenido, fuimos testigos eh, de un gran repunte en la transparencia y colaboración de aspectos ESG en toda la industria de bienes raíces. Los problemas de ESG, como sabemos, no son nada nuevos, por supuesto, pero la crisis eh, eh, por la que hemos estado pasando los ha intensificado y ha subrayado lo crítico que es construir resiliencia para problemas sistémicos como la crisis climática, la desigualdad social y la pérdida de, de la biodiversidad. 2020 eh, también vio como tal a los reguladores tomar el relevo de ESG como nunca antes, y los inversionistas han comenzado a exigir procesos y estrategias cada vez más granulares, estandarizados y validados para mejorar la gestión de riesgos. Eh, Larry Fink ha publicado en las cartas de inicio de año a sus accionistas y clientes un llamado cada vez más enfático a toda la industria a cambiar y mejorar sus estándares de ESG de manera muy seria y más recientemente resaltando obviamente el riesgo climático como el principal riesgo de la humanidad y el cambio que se ha tenido eh, en sus decisiones de inversión como tal. Pues por lo tanto, podemos decir que la pandemia ha dejado muy claro la complejidad e interconexión de nuestro mundo en términos de oferta y demanda, en comercio y cómo todo, 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 todo puede estar absolutamente amenazado de no ser manejado bajo una estrategia sostenible. Eh, la que sigue, Jess, por favor. Bien, eh, sabemos de antemano que no se puede gestionar lo que no se puede medir. En esta lámina podemos ver que para poder descarbonizar a nuestras empresas es muy importante primero medir a nivel de activo y después a nivel de portafolio los indicadores de desempeño clave 
para de esta manera poder hacer escenarios climáticos y de resiliencia que nos indiquen el valor de riesgo y la vulnerabilidad a la que se enfrentan las empresas. Pero si no tenemos el desempeño de las cuestiones energéticas, hídricas y de residuos a nivel de activo y menos de portafolio, no vamos a poder medir ese valor y por lo tanto va a ser más difícil transformar a la industria en el orden correcto. Para poder medir qué tan vulnerables son nuestros edificios y esta vulnerabilidad que representa financieramente en valor en riesgo, necesitamos cubrir los siguientes pasos. Eh, uno, medir y analizar los indicadores de desempeño a nivel de activo, como, como lo mencioné anteriormente, tanto los que gestiona el dueño como los del arrendatario. Recordemos que para los inversionistas, los dueños y administradores de las propiedades somos corresponsables de la huella de carbono de todo el inmueble y eso implica conocerla, reportarla y apoyar a los inclinos o a nuestros usuarios a reducirla. El punto dos es medir y analizar nuestros indicadores de desempeño a nivel de portafolio y en ese sentido compararnos con nuestros peers para entender si estamos dentro o fuera del promedio. Finalmente, en el punto tres, eh, con base en estos dos primeros que ya se mencionamos, podemos pasar a realizar escenarios climáticos y de resiliencia. Obviamente tenemos que considerar nuestros riesgos físicos, sociales y de transición para poder realizar una estrategia precisamente de resiliencia y cambio climático. La siguiente, Jess, por favor. Bueno, en esta diapositiva eh, se presenta en qué áreas de la empresa y en qué aspectos se mide la vulnerabilidad y valor de riesgo. En verde se enmarcan o se marcan, perdón, los aspectos que están relacionados directamente con los indicadores de desempeño. Es importante mencionar que el nivel de transparencia y de solidez de información que se nos está exigiendo a todos los sectores, en especial el real estate, requiere que este desempeño de colección de datos se haga de una manera muy sólida para que ayude precisamente a la reputación de la empresa y a poder colocar la tecnología donde se necesite para finalmente lograr disminución de costos operativos y, por lo tanto, la disminución de la huella de carbono. La siguiente, Jess, por favor. En esta diapositiva, lo que tratamos de enfatizar es que la implementación de objetivos de sostenibilidad y el desarrollo de productos para satisfacer la demanda de los inversionistas, de nuestros clientes y de, nuestros, eh, de nuestras partes interesadas, pues va, va a aumentar el valor del activo. Los activos que se diseñen, que se construyen o se gestionan de acuerdo con los puntos de vista de una perspectiva empresarial sostenible pueden beneficiarse de una mayor demanda, obviamente, de ocupantes y, por lo tanto, atracción de inversionistas. Como sabemos, los indicadores más comunes e importantes para poder tener estrategias y objetivos sólidos de resiliencia y cambio climático son los que tienen que ver con el consumo de energía, consumo de agua y medición de gases de efecto invernadero. Sin embargo, aunado a ellos, han surgido nuevos indicadores de desempeño que involucran la medición del riesgo financiero precisamente debido al cambio climático. En conclusión, la colección de datos ambientales para demostrar el desempeño ambiental de las empresas tiene que tener un componente de análisis y de mejora continua definitivamente. Y bueno, por, por enfatizar también este punto, eh, los objetivos de desempeño son importantes por muchas razones. Eh, obviamente ahorro de costos, vamos a tener un ahorro importante de costos, alineación con las previsiones, eh, vamos a dar forma a los objetivos de mitigación futuros, vamos a impulsar la transparencia y la responsabilidad, vamos a construir resiliencia y disminuir las vulnerabilidades y combatir la emisión operativa mediante la identificación de oportunidades de reducción. Eh, la siguiente, por favor. Y bueno, finalmente, eh, es, es por ello que con una visión desde un enfoque de arriba hacia abajo, muchas organizaciones en todo el mundo hacen referencia explícita a los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de las Naciones Unidas eh, dentro de las iniciativas climáticas corporativas. Como podemos ver en la figura, específicamente los ODS 13 y 7, estos objetivos se refieren principalmente al desarrollo clave de energía y huella de carbono los cuales son los indicadores claves para esta transformación que mencionábamos. Es por eso que como todas las empresas saben de esta transformación y de esta carrera al cero carbono que estamos viviendo, aquí se puede ver que es a los objetivos que más énfasis se están poniendo, ¿no? son los que mayor crecimiento tienen en la implementación. 
Eh, y bueno, de esta manera eh, concluyo la parte de antecedentes de, de esta presentación. Muchas gracias. Ya. Gracias a ti, Vané. Y bueno, pues ahora vamos a seguir con lo que es en sí el componente de desempeño de GRESP. Este, nos da mucho gusto presentar de nuevo, eh, Víctor nos, nos acompañó en el primer eh, webinar de GRESP que tuvimos en diciembre y hoy también nos acompaña, él es analista inmobiliario de GRESP, eh, tiene una maestría en ciencias arquitectónicas en la Universidad de Sydney y después de graduarse, él se enfocó en edificios de alto rendimiento. Asimismo, él participó en Brasil en proyectos de energías renovables y de incluirlas más en el mercado. Y posteriormente se ingresó a GRESP como responsable de análisis de estrategias ESG, en donde él revisa los assessments que nosotros mandamos y también cómo van a ser los cambios en el assessment año con año. La verdad, Víctor, muchas gracias por estar aquí y son todos tuyos. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jessica, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Victor. I'm an analyst at Real Estate at Grasp. And today I'll be talking about the performance components of the real estate assessment. And as you can see in this slide, this is an agenda that gives a high level idea what we'll be addressing on, in today in this webinar. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you who didn't attend the last webinar about the management component, I would like to take a step back and remind you what is the GRASP Real Estate Assessment. So the GRASP Real Estate Assessment uh, is an annual online assessment covering ESG-related indicators. And this assessment is aligned with international ESG reporting frameworks, guidelines, and best practice recommendations. GRASP then translates the sustainability performance reported uh, across all these indicators into a GRASP score. This GRASP score is then comparable and benchmarked against uh, your peers. Next slide, please. So today we will be focusing on the performance component of the real estate assessment. The performance component measures the entity's asset, asset performance composing of information collected at the fund level and at the asset level. The performance component is also suitable for any real estate company and fund that held operational assets within the reporting year. Next slide. In this slide, you can see uh, the performance components on the left, followed by the management component that was addressed in the previous webinar. These two components together compose the standard investment benchmark, as well as generate you a GRASP score. Uh, the remaining component is the development component, and this will be addressed in the following webinar uh, with Pima in the next few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide provides an overview of the structure of the real estate assessment. So the assessment is divided into three components and each component is broken down into aspects. What is those aspects? So aspects are a group of indicators uh, that together correspond to a similar intent or scope. And today we're gonna to talk about the aspects of the performance components uh, in the next slide, uh, please, Jessica. So uh, looking at the performance component, we can divide uh, these aspects into two groups. The first one being the aspects that capture information at the fund level, and the second one being the aspects that capture information at the asset level. It is also uh, possible to note uh, that the number of points allocated to each of these aspects, and therefore understand that there's aspects that capture asset level information holds a big portion of the total points of the performance components. But in order to clarify uh, what is the difference between collecting information at the fund level and at the asset level, we will go through some examples in the next slides. Next slide, please. So let's start uh, with the targets aspect, uh, where we collect information at the fund level. Uh, here you can see uh, indicator T1.1 uh, that captured the fund's long-term performance improvement targets. The fund level indicator will always start with a yes or no question, similarly to the one in this slide. Once a participant provides an answer to this question, and let's say the answer was yes, the answer options for this particular indicator will show up as we can see in this slide. 
So now you will be required to provide further details on your improvement targets, such as the area of the targets being energy consumption, THC emission, energy use, uh, the target type that can be an intensity based target, which means setting a target for five years from now to reduce your energy intensity of your portfolio. The target type could also be a like-for-like -like target, which can be like setting a goal to reduce your energy consumption by an X amount uh, of kilowatt hours after five years. And that target type can also be an absolute target that is setting a goal to decrease the energy consumption of your portfolio by 30% in, in four years. We also capture the percentage of improvements that you define by this target, the baseline year and the end year, as well as if these targets are externally communicated. Next slide, please. We have elements in the reference guide that addresses each of these characteristics in the indicators as shown in these slides, such as the intent of the indicator, which is why are we capturing this information, the indicator requirements, how it should be reported, uh, the validation, which defines uh, what rules should be followed in order to report to this indicator, the terminology, uh, what does uh, the terms in this indicator mean, and the references, uh, where does this indicator come from. Here you can also find uh, the alignment of this indicator with different uh, industry frameworks. As an example, the intent of T1.1 is to guide entities and their employees towards measurable improvements and are a key determinant to integrate ESG into business operation. It is important to note here that GRASP does not assess the ambition of these targets, but the existence of credible targets, meaning that we are not looking at the improvement uh, percentage of, let's say, your renewable energy use, but if you have a target to increase your renewable energy usage in the next years. Uh, next slide, please. As an example uh, from the tenants and community aspects, uh, we will go through the indicator TC2.1, which captured the tenant satisfaction survey. The intent of TC2.1 is to evaluate whether and to what extent the entity engage with their tenants regarding their satisfaction. Uh, tenant satisfaction surveys help entities uh, understand critical issues within their portfolio, engage with their tenants, and increase tenant satisfaction, which may contribute to improving retention rates and productivity. It is also important that tenant satisfaction surveys are translated into easily interpretable metrics, so you can compare the outcome of the, your survey between different uh, kind of tenants. Next slide, please. Uh, so similar to the targets indicator, uh, once a participant select yes, you'll be provided with the answer options for this indicator. But before jumping to the answer options, uh, what is a tenant satisfaction survey? A uh, tenant satisfaction survey is a list of questions that could range, for example, from five to 50 questions that aims to understand the satisfaction level of your tenants through a set of quantitative metrics. In TC2.1, uh, we capture whether the survey was conducted internally or by an independent third party, as well as the metrics that it was included in the survey, such as net promoter score, overall satisfaction score, satisfaction of communication, among others. And in addition to this indicator that we're showing in the slide, uh, we also have other eight indicators that cover the tenants and community topic in our assessment as the engagement with tenants is key to achieve a high building performance. Next slide, please. So now the data monitor and review uh, consists of four indicators, and each one of them refer to the external review of performance metric we capture at the asset level, which means energy consumption, GHG emissions, water consumption, and waste management. Here we will go through uh, indicator MR1 that captures whether an entity had uh, their energy consumption reviewed by an indica uh, independent third party. Uh, next slide, please. 
So once an answer is provided to the, uh, can you come back one slide, Jessica, please? Yeah, thanks. So once an answer is provided to this high level question, uh, the answer options uh, will appear similarly to the other indicators we presented previously. And the participant will need to specify whether the consumption data was externally checked, verified or assured. The intent of this indicator is to provide investors and participants with confidence regarding the integrity and reliability of the reported information. And this can be achieved through a third party review of ESG data. The differences between checked, assured and verified uh, can be found in our reference guide and therefore we won't be addressing it uh, here today. Uh, next slide, please. So as mentioned in my previous slides, some aspects of the performance component collect information at the asset level. And this information is collected through what we call the GRASP asset spreadsheet, which is an Excel document. The asset spreadsheet uh, should be completed for all assets in your fund's portfolio. Once the spreadsheet is completed, participants have to upload their asset spreadsheet into the GRASP portal to populate the corresponding fields in the real estate assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide provides a great overview of the metrics we collect at the asset level through the asset spreadsheet. It is possible to note the granularity behind the data points that GRASP require participants to report at the asset level. But it's also important to note that this granularity allows GRASP to provide participants with an accurate and insightful output enabling them to have a deep understanding of how their portfolio is performing and also how their portfolio is performing against their peers. So in the left-hand side, uh, we have the building certification aspect where we collect if your assets are green building certified by certification schemes such as LEED, EDGE, among others. We also collect if your asset have any energy rating. So in the efficiency measures uh, aspect, we capture whether your asset has performed a building technical assessment, which is like understanding any improvement opportunities in the scope of energy, water, and waste within your asset. We also capture uh, whether you have implemented any energy, water, and waste efficiency measure in your assets. Examples of efficiency measures could be like installation of LEDs, uh, this is an energy efficiency measure, for water efficiency measure, you can install automatic meter readings. For waste, it can be performed by a waste stream audit, among others. Uh, finally, uh, the energy aspects. Uh, GRASP collects information on the asset reporting level, meaning uh, if your consumption is reported at the whole building level, or you have your assets submitted, and then you can report on the split of your base building and tenant spaces. We also collect the assets data availability, which is the amount of time that uh, you have data for in the reporting year. You collect the energy data, which refers to the different energy types, electricity, fuel, and district heating and cooling. And as well as we capture the data coverage you have for each of these energy types. Uh, finally, we also collect the renewable energy use in the asset, uh, which means the absolute renewable energy use broke down by on-site generation or purchase off-site, as well as by operational control, meaning it was the landlord or the tenant who procured this energy. Uh, similarly to the energy aspects, uh, the GHG emissions, water and waste aspects also follows the same approach of reporting. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of how the energy aspect looks like in the asset spreadsheet. At the top of the slide, it is possible to note uh, the other tabs of the asset spreadsheet that refers to the metrics I've mentioned in my previous slides. We collect these different metrics on different tabs of the asset spreadsheet. As you can see with the building certification tab, efficiency measures, energy, et cetera. Uh, in this slide, we are referring only to the whole building reporting level. It's, it's important to note that for each asset, we have two rows in the asset spreadsheet. And that's why, uh, because GRASP 
asks the participants to report on both current year consumption and last year consumption, which allow us to track the assets improvements over year. And this is one of the metrics that we score in our assessment through the like for like change. Uh, looking at the table in this slide, uh, we can see that in the left corner, after the reporting characteristics column, we have the data availability fields that consists of a starting date and an end date within the reporting year. Next to it, GRASP captures the consumption value for each energy type, as well as the floor area for which the participant has coverage on the corresponding energy type. Uh, your floor area data coverage will then be defined by dividing these fields of floor area covered by the maximum floor area. We are, the renewable energy fields are not addressed in these slides, as well as the split for base building and tenant spaces. Uh, next slide, Jessica, please. Uh, finally, in this slide, we have an overview of what aspects contribute to your real estate score. Uh, this is similar to a slide that Dan mentioned earlier. So you can see that the performance aspects such as building certifications, data monitoring review, waste, water, GHG, energy, tenants and communities, targets, and risk assessments are colored in dark green. Uh, the light green colored aspects refer to the management component that was addressed in the last webinar. Each uh, slice size of the pie chart corresponds to the weight of the corresponding aspect in the grass real estate score. And the performance component accounts for 70% of the real estate score, as opposed to 30% uh, that the management component accounts for. In the future, GRASP plans to keep the focus on scoring performance, as this is the key to drive sustainability in real assets. And with that, I thank you all for your time. I hope that the performance component of the real estate assessment is a bit clearer now. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions by the end of the webinar, uh, or you can always contact us by the contact form in our website. Uh, over to you, Jessica, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. It has been great to hear from you the perspective of the performance component. I'm going to switch to Spanish again. Entonces, bueno, la verdad estuvo muy bien la presentación de Víctor porque pudimos ver de estos 70 puntos o 70 por ciento de 100 que vale el componente de desempeño, cómo está dividido y la información que tenemos que reportar a nivel activo y a nivel compañía. Entonces, bueno, estamos eh, súper orgullosos de presentarles a nuestro siguiente keynote speaker, que es Ethan Gilbert, que es Program Manager de ESG en Prologis. Eh, Ethan, pro, como saben, Prologis es el dueño más grande de activos de logística a nivel mundial y son líderes en aspectos de GRESP. Entonces es por ello que, que los invitamos aquí. Nos da muchísimo gusto que estén con nosotros. Y Ethan ha sido parte de Prologis por los últimos tres años. Él es encargado de dirigir las estrategias este, y de establecer objetivos eh, en toda su estrategia de ESG, tanto para la compañía como a nivel global. Eh, Ethan este, tiene una maestría en, de ciencias ambientales y políticas ambientales en la Universidad de Johns Hopkins. Y bueno, él vive en Denver, Colorado. Es encargado también de revisar los programas de GRESP de Prologis. Entonces, uh, Ethan, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Gracias, Jessica, y gracias a todos por la oportunidad. Uh, <laughs> yo hablo un poco de español, pero no bastante para a toda la presentación, entonces ahora me voy a cambiar a inglés. Uh, so thank you everyone for this opportunity. Um, this is really a great uh, privilege for me to be able to uh, talk about um, the, the great work that our teams in Latin America are doing with regards to the GRESB assessment. Um, Prologis has been a partner uh, and participant in GRESB dating back to, I think, the, the very earliest days um, and, and we've kind of, as Dan sort of talked about, walked, uh, walked through the progression 
Um, and I think for us, it's been a very useful tool to not only sort of evaluate our own uh, performance internally, but also externally compared to our peers and, and how we can continue to evolve and um, grow our focus on uh, incorporating ESG and sustainability into our business strategy. So uh, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, Prologis has really been uh, incorporating and, and interweaving sustainability and ESG within our business strategy. Uh, we realize for us uh, as a global company, there is tremendous value that can be uh, derived from having a focus on ESG, uh, whether that's driving revenues in the near term or building a brand and, and a reputation as a sustainability leader that can help us to continue to attract customers and investors that share with us a commitment and interest in promoting sustainability. Similarly, we know that um, when we think about how we operate our assets and, and operate our business, uh, a focus on sustainability can help us to reduce costs, both within uh, our own operations, but within the operations of our customers, and also really mitigate risks. Um, I think as Vanessa talked about before, um, you know, there is a, a huge risk kind of in the future, and then it's becoming even more and more frequently the present uh, related to climate change. And so a focus on sustainability and looking at the resilience of our assets uh, helps us save long-term costs and, and be better prepared for the future. Uh, for the next slide, please. So as a global company, uh, we are driven by setting global environmental objectives. Uh, and, and this helps us again to really amplify our impact and, and have a more um, meaningful impact globally, um, but it also helps to, to further our efforts by having a, a, um, a focus from a, a centralized global position uh, that kind of then can be distributed amongst the countries where we operate in. So we operate in 19 countries, um, but we utilize our, our global central ESG platform to really set the direction and drive that activity and, and hold accountability for our, our efforts to make sure that we're pushing forward. Uh, so some of the environmental objectives that we uh, have set and manage and measure on a regular basis include uh, the sustainable building certifications that we have across our global portfolio, um, cool and reflective roofing, uh, LED lighting. Uh, this has been a major focus for us. And, and um, this, uh, when we think about the GRESP assessment and, and you're thinking about the performance component, when you talk about uh, efficiency measures. Um, this is another area where we look to capture that and take credit for the efforts that we're doing to upgrade our buildings to LED lighting. Uh, we can take credit for that within the efficiency measures component of or aspect of the performance component. We've also been expanding our solar footprint and continue to grow that and that has uh, also ramifications to the GRESP assessment. And, and I think one of the biggest ones here as well is our science-based target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, our scope three emissions are encompassing of our tenant energy use. So Prologis is primarily a triple net lease building owner. So the energy use uh, by our customers is uh, not within our control, but we do try to include it within our scope. Uh, so um, it's, uh, that's always, <laughs> I think, as we'll talk about later, you know, uh, part of the, the challenge with uh, something like GRESB and, and I think the growing expectation of investors is what is the energy use within your spaces? And, and for a building owner like us, uh, it creates opportunity for us to engage with our customers um, and explore options like uh, including uh, data sharing components within our lease agreements. Um, but at the end of the day, that's it's not something that's totally changed our business model. And so we do have to work with our tenants and our customers to uh, access that energy data uh, so that we can better understand how we can be a better landlord and partner with them and helping them achieve their own sustainability goals. So next, uh, I'll touch quickly on um, two of our funds. As uh, Dan called out earlier, we do respond 10 times to GRES. So uh, my, my summer is always filled with GRESB and, and I sometimes uh, get cross-eyed with how many different submissions I'm completing, but 
uh, at the end of the day, um, it is always good to, to be able to take a global ESG program and then also focus on the activities of our regional and, and country efforts. So uh, in Mexico, we have a publicly traded Fibra, Fibra Prologis. Um, and in 2020, this uh, entity was the number one uh, publicly listed industrial tenant controlled uh, respondent to the GRESB assessment. So uh, some things that helped them within the performance component to achieve this uh, high level of distinction um, included the uh, acquisition or the attainment of 17 BOMA best certifications. Um, so when GRESB uh, bifurcated the sustainable building certifications into two different, the existing building and the new construction, um, there was the uh, continued recognition of our efforts to have new construction sustainably certified, but this also gave an opportunity for our uh, entity in Mexico to get some credit for the um, attainment of these existing building certifications. Um, and uh, we're continuing to realize the benefits of going down this path of getting these existing building certifications because it's creating insights that we can share with our customers on how to continue to improve the performance of the building. Um, I also want to absolutely give credit to my colleagues in Mexico. They are truly dedicated and committed to, to helping me in this effort. Um, I would not be successful without them. And, and I think that's reflective in, in how the fund is. Um, it's a reflection of the, the dedication and effort of the regional and property management teams to go out and, and seek out the data so that we can have a strong um, level of data coverage within the performance component within the, the various performance indicators. Next, uh, I'll talk about another um, one of our entities, and I think this creates kind of an, a, a useful counter example. Um, so this is our private joint venture fund that we have in Brazil with Ivanhoe Cambridge. Um, and uh, this entity was uh, received the recognition as the number one industrial, private, non-listed, um, and uh, tenant controlled entity for the Americas. Um, and again, I think what we really benefit with this entity is the fact that we have a great partnership with Ivanhoe Cambridge, and they share with Prologis a strong commitment and, and focus on promoting sustainability within uh, the assets that we co-own. And so um, from that point of view, um, they've been a great partner, and, and they've also helped to make sure that the 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 assets held in this portfolio are relatively new, but um, they are predominantly LEED certified. So when they are going through the new construction and, and being finalized from construction, um, we do submit them for LEED certification. And this is based on uh, both a, a commitment and, and focus by Prologis to having all new developments uh, LEED certified or sustainably certified on, in other geographies. Um, but it's also shared with Ivanhoe Cambridge. They, they really realize that there can be tremendous value in getting that third party verified certification to really show that the building is, is above, um, above and beyond. Uh, and so um, again, this is another area where we also benefit uh, to the same extent from good um, regional and local resources focused on getting us the data coverage that we need. Um, and so I think when it comes to the performance component, having those things in place, uh, a dedicated team that's local and, and really focused on gathering the data and, and any of the many means available, whether that's engaging with tenants directly and asking them to share energy data or water data, or uh, looking at some of the automated systems for gathering that type of data, including data sharing components within lease agreements as part of like a green lease clause. All of those things really help to drive the building owner's ability to better measure and therefore manage um, the performance of the building. Um, and so uh, it's, it's always a, a nice way to understand how um, you know, we can continue to perform. And I think RES always serves as a useful measuring stick uh, for our own operations and then helps to guide our our various fund teams and then our local property managers and, and how we can continue to improve the performance of our assets to the benefit of our customers. So with that, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ethan. It has been extremely helpful to see how Prologis is driving this. 
and how it's important to have uh, a team management of all the information regarding with tenants and the leases and all the commitment and stakeholder holder engagement that you need to pursue in order to to better measure and as you say managed uh, esg data so this has been great and so uh, with this uh, thank you very much Itan, and, and i'm going to switch to to spanish again uh, to pass to the q a um, uh, session so um, let me see the, the questions. A ver, vamos a ver las preguntas. Entonces, bueno, primero preguntó eh, Gabriela Sabadini eh, si existe una relación. Sí. A ver, voy a ver si, si se pueden poner en mute. Sería genial. Ok, bueno, entonces pregunto si existe una relación entre el punto 3 que estaba hablando Vanessa sobre el camino de la transformación que estamos proponiendo de primero tener información sobre los activos, después tener información sobre el portafolio y después tener escenarios climáticos y de resiliencia con los aspectos que establece CBTI y TCFD. Y sí, efectivamente sí, porque estos niveles de, de información y de detalle que nos están solicitando son estos escenarios de cómo se relacionan los aspectos de los performance indicators. Hablamos primordialmente energía, agua, residuos y las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero con eh, los aspectos financieros de la empresa. Ajá. Entonces, a ese tipo de escenarios es a lo que se pretende llegar y es por ello que sí necesitamos primero la información a nivel activo y portafolio. Eh, después, eh, bueno, aquí ya hay algunas preguntas que han sido respondidas, pero sí quiero resaltar eh, algunas importantes. Este... Bueno, se preguntaba si las certificaciones, que es de los puntos que más peso tienen dentro de este componente de desempeño, valen lo mismo. Y entonces, pues es una, una pregunta relevante. Si ¿Sí valen lo mismo las certificaciones que son integrales, las certificaciones que solo miden algún aspecto como Energy Star, esas se toman en cuenta de manera parcial. Pero obviamente nosotros este, les recomendamos eh, que pues la, la cuestión de las certificaciones no la hagan por un tema de tener una estrellita, lo cual creo que es muy válido y es un plus. Sin embargo, hay que verlo como también una herramienta que nos va a llevar a este camino de la transformación y que va a demostrar a todos los grupos de interés que nuestro activo pues es eficiente, ¿no? Y, y que está logrando los niveles que están pidiendo. Ok, eh, aquí hay una pregunta para Ethan, se la voy a traducir. Uh, Ethan, there is a question for you. Emma Wizard is asking, what has been the biggest challenge on getting building certification specifically in Mexico? So for, for our Mexico um, buildings and, and our Mexico entity, um, we have kind of a two-sided approach. Uh, so when we're developing new assets, um, those are primarily developed by Prologis um, and the Fibra, Prolo the Fibra in Mexico uh, is just the, the asset owner. Um, and so when it comes to uh, those buildings, when we're developing them, we, we use our um, global platform again uh, to pursue sustainable building certifications, particularly LEED certifications when uh, constructing new buildings. Uh, and then we have realized this new opportunity. And I think uh, we kind of helped to open the door for BOMA to enter the Mexico market. Um, and so as we've uh, experimented with BOMA Best, uh, we've seen again that it can be valuable for uh, our customers and tenants. Um, and so I think that was just sort of a, an experiment and, an, and uh, a pilot. So as, as it comes to uh, certification in, in Mexico, I think LEED does serve a, a good purpose for um, a, a benchmark to, to certify buildings to, for new construction especially. 
Um, and then existing building certification schemes like BOMA, I think are increasingly becoming available and helping you to uh, get into buildings and look at that. So um, I think, you know, there's challenges getting certifications anywhere in the world. Um, I wouldn't say that they're exclusive to Mexico, um, but uh, I think if you, if you can uh, continue to stay focused on it and uh, you can really continue to promote the value that can come from getting those buildings certified. Muy bien. Bueno, voy a, thank you, Ethan. I'm going to say the last question. Voy a decir la, la última pregunta que hicieron, eh, que ya fue respondida, pero para compartirla con todos. Eric Reyes eh, dijo que por qué era importante comentar sobre el área o la cobertura de los datos que se están dando. Y bueno, contestó Víctor Fonseca que es vital poder contar con el área porque de esta manera podemos entender la cobertura del portafolio que está reportando realmente el desempeño, ¿no? O sea, podemos tener tal vez los datos like for like de 10 activos de 100, entonces eso sería el 10% realmente del desempeño del portafolio. ¿no? Lo, lo que está buscando todo el mundo es llegar a una cobertura de 100%, pues para poder realmente representar el desempeño del, del portafolio. Entonces, bueno, eh, queremos dar las siguientes conclusiones y recomendaciones. Eh, nosotros creemos que es muy importante establecer protocolos formales y sólidos, primero de la recolección, análisis y mejora continua de los datos, tanto en áreas comunes como en áreas rentadas. O sea, muchas veces la gente en los portafolios, tanto los property managers, este, asset managers, se dedican a recolectar datos nada más por reco recolectar y no se analizan. Ajá, entonces es, viene pegado el que si estás recolectando los datos, tienes que analizarlos y tienes que establecer ese proceso de mejora continua que implica que tengas comunicaciones tanto con tu equipo como con los arrendatarios. Ese es el punto vital. Posteriormente es eh, desarrollar esta herramienta de comunicación y capacitación, así como lo mencionaba Ethan, de, de cuestiones que realmente te den un engagement, un compromiso con tus grupos de interés para que estos procesos de colección de datos se fortalezcan ¿ajá? y que se cree un valor compartido de por qué es importante para el fund manager recolectar los datos y por qué es importante para el arrendatario recolectar los datos. Como punto número tres, recomendamos utilizar los KPIs de desempeño como base de esta transformación a, a cero carbono este, y que realmente sean una guía para disminuir la huella hídrica y de carbono y empezar a forjar un camino de resiliencia y cambio climático. Y también revisar la implementación de certificaciones para validar el desempeño de los activos. Como vimos, las certificaciones son vitales, pero como lo decíamos, o sea, como también una guía para poder transformar los activos en activos más eficientes y más resilientes. ¿Mm? Entonces, bueno, antes de terminar el webinar, queremos agradecer a todos los asistentes. Nos da mucho gusto que mucha más gente de Latinoamérica se esté sumando a estos. Como saben, es la primera vez que Gres hace junto con nosotros, que somos sus socios en Latinoamérica, este tipo de webinars enfocados específicamente para la región. Eh, le queremos dar muchísimas gracias a la AMPIP, a la IFC, a los GBC de Chile, a SUME, a Green Group de Costa Rica, de Chile, a Ámbito Arquitectura de Costa Rica, a Brasil para que eh, nos hayan ayudado, también a Perú y El Salvador, eh, que, quienes están sumando en, en apoyarnos en, en estos webinars y quienes están muy interesados en sumarse a GRES como una estrategia de mejora continua en, en esta estrategia de ESG. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, eh, les agradezco muchísimo su atención y espero eh, poder contar con ustedes en, en un futuro cercano, en el siguiente webinar. Eh, recuerden que eh, los que hayan participado en los tres webinars van a recibir una, un diploma. Este, entonces, bueno, gracias a los que ya llevan dos y esperemos contar con ustedes el 24 de marzo en, en el siguiente webinar de desempeño. Uh, thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you very much, Dan, Victor, Vanessa. It has been a pleasure to have you here. 
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Gracias a todos. Gracias. Gracias, Itan. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.